morning crypto. Good morning, Warriors. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of your favorite crypto news channel, Good Morning Crypto, where we bring you the most relevant and impactful crypto related topics from a top crypto research team in the world. I'm your host, Abs, joined by nobody this morning, but that's okay because we're going to have the Node Defender joining us later in the episode, and I'm very excited for today's show. Today on Good Morning Crypto, we will be discussing how, according to Raul Paul, the US and UK governments created Bitcoin to deal with the future monetary crisis. We're also going to hear from Homeland Security as they claim to have tracked down the four Satoshis in California during 2016. We're also going to break down how Stellar is adding smart contracts to their network, creating a massive catalyst for institutions to leverage this blockchain. And with the largest financial firms on the planet in the process of turning digital, we break down the details, showing our community how this next bull run is shaping up to be the greatest opportunity of our era. Our show is available on your favorite podcast platforms like Spotify and Apple Music. And for those of you listening via podcasts, our show is live on YouTube Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern at the 3T Warrior Academy channel. So lucky for our listeners, guys, there's no need to do introductions this morning and we can get straight into the news. But we're going to start this thing off the same way we always do by checking out the Good Morning Crypto Twitter account. That's at 3TGM Crypto on Twitter. Go smash that follow button if you're looking for updates all throughout the day. When we check out some of our daily movers this morning, the market, it's up about 5% across the board. We've got projects like AVAX up 8%, Quant Networks up 5%, and Algorand also up about 5% on the day. When we check out our Merlin market update this morning, we are sitting at $1.60 trillion in total market cap. Bitcoin is 51% dominance. Ethereum is about 17%. We've got Bitcoin sitting at 41400 Ethereum is 2256 Solana is trading at $91. And XRP is trading at $0.52 cents this morning. And guys, because it's just me, I'm not going to keep the people waiting. We're going to get straight into the news for today. And one of the biggest conspiracies that we have going on in the crypto market is who created Bitcoin and why is the narrative that Satoshi was the sole creator? So today I've got some really interesting videos to provide for our listeners. We're going to listen to who many people call the trillion dollar man, Dan Pena, who lives in a castle in Europe, talking about Bitcoin and the founding of Bitcoin. But Mario, I just saw you jumped into the show as well. So before we get into all this content, how you feel, my friend? Feeling good, brother. Good morning. Hope you're all doing amazing out there. Everybody in the chat listening now and in the future. Hope you're doing amazing abs. I'm I'm feeling great, man. Once again, happy to be here and let's do this uh, crypto talk. Well, Mario, we're about to go down the rabbit hole as we speak, guys. So smash that like button and get ready for an exciting episode. This is an article from Goldman Sachs, former executive Raul Paul and his theory about who created Bitcoin and what the purpose was behind its creation. So the CEO uh, currently states that he thinks Satoshi, the anonymous inventor of Bitcoin, might be the U.S. and U.K. governments collaborating and creating a digital currency. Raul Paul says that he believes Bitcoin's synonymous founder was actually just a group of employees at the U.S. National Securities Agency and the U.K.'s communications headquarters, which were tasked with experimenting with possible solutions to game out future threats to the West's international money dominance. So long story short, they're preparing for the collapse of the US dollar and these two agencies are working on solutions. The former Goldman Sachs executive says he actually spoke with the Department of Defense official in 2013 or 2014 about these exact threats. And after stating this, he was given the response from the actual employee at the Department of Justice, we're worried about debt, we're worried about the system blowing up. I said, yes, obviously everybody is, because that's one of the things that we need to game out. What happens if the West loses control of the money, the debt, and everything else? Raul Paul continued, well, I think the answer is there, and I think it's Bitcoin, he said. Yeah, tell me more. I said, I think the U.S. government and the U.K. government invented Bitcoin, which the NSA and the GCHQ located in the U.K., who are two of the world's largest centers of cryptography. I asked the Department of Defense what they said, and they believe yeah, we've considered that as well. So Mario, I am going to kick it to you for some comments, but this is a video I found earlier this morning from Homeland Security. And what I found so interesting about this video is they're claiming to have tracked down Satoshi Nakamoto back in 2016, and they found four developers in California, but I'm going to listen to them and then we'll comment about it. Here we go. Bitcoin was the most prevalent at that point. We had seized quite a bit of it, millions of dollars worth under the Silk Road investigation. So one of our agents who started looking at another online marketplace um, through the deep web, which was called Black Market Reloaded, they were sending weapons um, through packages and through at ordering them on the dark web. And he was really, really smart, forward-leaning agent. And he goes, 
I want to go interview Satoshi Nakamoto. And we're like, what? He said, yeah, I want to go interview this guy. And at the time, we're like, hey, it's a figment of somebody's imagination. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not true. So, you know, we had all this pushback from our headquarters. And we thought, hey, if an agent wants to go talk to him and we have some money, why don't we send him? Let's find out how this works. So as it came to be, the agents flew out to California and they realized that he wasn't alone in creating this. There were three other people and he, they sat down and met with them and talked to them to find out how this actually works and what their reason for it was. So those are some bold claims right there, Mario. And what catches my attention about the Bitcoin narrative is some of the smartest players in the market, whether it's Michael Saylor or Mark Yusko, all of these guys agree Bitcoin is one, decentralized, and two, nobody knows who created it. So I think it's interesting that that narrative kind of fits the picture that they're trying to create, that Bitcoin is outside of the U.S. currency's dominance. It's a separate system. It's got its own small economy. And I just want to read one more quote before I kick it to you. Raul Paul, remember this. He explained what his theory was about the U.K. and U.S. governments collaborating to build uh, Bitcoin to the Department of Defense in the USA. And they told him, yes, we've considered that, too. While Raul Paul also highlighted Bitcoin's release at the height of the 2008 financial crisis, and he stated, I don't think it's a coincidence that it came out in 2008 during the financial crisis. I don't think it's a coincidence that the halving cycle and all of this are related. It is a solution and always has been a solution. You just can't go there tomorrow. So he's talking about building and he's talking about what we're witnessing today. What I'm really excited to break down, Mario, is the video we have from Dan Pena as well, because he put out this, this quote and it really stuck with me. He said, um, sorry, the, the live chat distracted me. We are going to get into the green list later on in the episode, guys. Don't worry. We're just talking about the founding of Bitcoin to start the show. But what he said is that if we, people knew who Bitcoin was, who created Bitcoin, they would be horrified and they'd sell it right away. So a lot of people assumed he was talking about Putin. It, there's a new conspiracy that's emerging. So I'm excited to break that down. But first of all, what do you think about Raul Paul's theories that the 2008 financial crisis was incentive for them to launch this? And it was actually the U.S. government's collaborating with the U.K. Yeah, like when you listen to a lot of these uh, like narratives around who created Bitcoin, who the real Satoshi, you know, or Satoshis are, like I think a lot of it makes complete sense. Like when you look at the timing of when it came out and as, as we talk about the 2008 crisis and then the inception of Bitcoin, like I think the, the very beginning of Bitcoin and I wasn't there, but, but but the kind of feeling that I get every time that I hear about it from people who were there, it doesn't feel very government-like. It doesn't feel very – like the movement of, about how Bitcoin was created was to be this decentralized online, like kind of like internet money, right? Um, but over the years, we've seen the way that Bitcoin has evolved and the way that Bitcoin has been adopted. And as we look at all these different narratives and, and, and ideas behind who created it and the fact that – we don't even know the real identity of who created it besides a, a, a name, Satoshi Nakamoto. I think all of it makes complete sense, you know, and we can call it conspiracy theories, but typically conspiracy theories are only theories until they become true. And oftentimes they, they can become true. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's government related. It, it makes like it adds up completely. Um, and especially the way that we're seeing Bitcoin's especially the way that we're seeing Bitcoin kind of get to where it's at today, it, it really wouldn't surprise me. Now, Dan Pena's comments, I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've heard that video of him saying, saying, making those exact comments. And that, you know, does he really know um, who created Bitcoin or is he, is he just saying that because he has this theory in, in him? Uh, you know, could it be Russian government? Could it be Chinese government? Is there a master plan to Bitcoin? Is there a master plan to like put Bitcoin in the hands of everybody in the world to then get to some goal? I guess we'll find out in the future. Uh, but yeah, um, it wouldn't surprise me, man, if it's government and, and, and or anything like that. Well, there's two things that I want to focus on as well. The fact that the Homeland Security officers claim that they found the four Satoshis located in California tells me that. First of all, they're accessible. And second of all, I seriously doubt they were independently operating in what many call the, the, tech, the tech hub of the world. Silicon Valley is where technological developments take place. And so it's no surprise that when they tracked down Satoshi, he was located in that area. And guys, we're going to play this video, or ladies and gentlemen, actually, we're going to play this video from Dan Pena discussing who he believes founded Bitcoin. And he states something that really stuck with me. He said, if we knew who created Bitcoin, we wouldn't be able to sleep at night. You let me know in the live chat what your opinion is. 
Dan Pena talking about the founder of Bitcoin. Who, who was really behind Bitcoin? Really behind Bitcoin? You would run as fast as you fucking could to sell it. I know. 100%. If you knew who owned Bitcoin or who started Bitcoin, you and you had Bitcoin, you couldn't sleep at night. I know. 100%. And when the real founder a Bitcoin comes out, it is my humble opinion, and there's nothing humble about me. Bitcoin will go to fucking zero. One day. And a, a microsecond, boom, like that. All right, so no. And now here's the thing about Dan Pena's statements, right? I think he's actually not hinting at a Putin. I think he's hinting at something much more dark and nefarious there. But here's what I would say. Central intelligence organizations are what sit above the governments when it comes to global dominance, right? So it's important to keep those things in mind. Dan Payne is not hinting at the fact that, oh, some government organization created it. You're not going to believe it. For him to make those statements, I do think it's something much more nefarious. But the second part is that there's just so many people who are willing to buy this asset right now. Brazil, UK, El Salvador, every single country is beginning to accept Bitcoin. And I do think if the founder came out and it was somebody horrible... I don't think it would be a catalyst to cause Bitcoin to go to zero. I genuinely don't. And let's play worst case scenario here, right? If it was what quote unquote worst case scenario for the founder, I don't think the founder's wallet currently has enough control to ruin the idea behind what Bitcoin provides. A decentralized currency, self-ownership, self-sovereignty, not needing to go through banks to make payments. Those ideas still exist regardless of who created Bitcoin. And I think Raul Paul's statements, which we broke down at the beginning of the episode, guys, those are much more relevant to the creation of Bitcoin as opposed to Dan Pena's. But Dan Pena makes a great point. He says, I'm not a humble guy. There's nothing about me. And this is my prediction. So he's making some bold claims, Mario. What was your takeaway? Well, actually, it didn't sound like a prediction. He said multiple times, 100%, I know. So like, does he really know 100% or is he just being confident in his in his thesis and his in, in his uh, what in who he thinks is the creator of Bitcoin, because we know Dan Peng is like that. He he knows something or he thinks he knows something and he sticks with it. So like not to say that he's wrong. Like I, I am not like I don't think Bitcoin's going to go to zero. That part, I think he's wrong. Um, the truth is Bitcoin was created to be decentralized. Right. However, that might have been the the true intentions or not. That was the original uh, white paper was for it to be decentralized. And the truth is Bitcoin is becoming less, less decentralized. Like the mining is is more centralized than ever. Yeah, okay, we've got all these different computers around the world or different miners around the world, but who owns those miners? And that's the centralized part of it. And now we're uh, the the um, holding part of the Bitcoin. It's becoming centralized too. We've got institutions. We've got the Bitcoin ETF, which is going to make it even more centralized. And that's okay because it's the evolution of that asset. And I see that evolution of that asset as in in order for it to become safer, in order for it to become mass, mass, massively adopted, this is kind of the road that it has to go through, right? And I, I get that some people are against it, uh, and that's not like what I'm trying to say. But as, the, as, Bitcoin, as Bitcoin continues in its path, I believe, and I've always, I've, I've always said it about crypto in general, there needs to be a centralization part to it. Because that's what's going to bring uh, safety and confidence for investors to get in. And so, yeah, I, as far as Dan Ping his comments, um, I believe he's wrong in the going to zero part. I think that at the stage that it's at now, unless, man, listen, unless it really is this bomb, <laughs> you know, as far as who created it. And that wallet from Satoshi Nakamoto ends up doing something unimaginable. Uh, but even so, it would be difficult for it to go to zero. I still think there'd just be people out there willing to buy the currency. I think that we're so far away from where we from zero because of where we are today. Companies like BlackRock, JP Morgan, Fidelity, Citibank, they're just entering the picture right now. It's not like they've been here and are adapting. They're literally just entering the phase of crypto adoption. So I do want to break down another video here, guys, because we are going to talk about the green list and how XRP was removed from the Department of Justice. Sorry, the Department of Financial Services removed XRP from its green list after Judge Torres ruled that XRP in and of itself was 
not a security. So once again, New York never fails us, guys. Let's hear what Meta Lawman and our good friend Digital Perspectives have to say. Here we go. After the ruling came out with Judge Torres, the XRP in and of itself is not a security. What happened in New York with the NYDFS, Jay? Less than two months later, um, the New York Department of Financial Services came out with an update to their green list. Now, I have um, been uh, complimentary of the New York Department of Financial Services for having a green list that the SEC does not have. And this green list says, if you're an exchange, you can offer these tokens to New York residents, you're good. You wanna, if you want to uh, list a new one, then you've gotta go through a process with us, which again, that makes sense as well. So I've been you know, um, complimentary of, of how it's been approached. And so XRP has been on the green list. Um, and so after Judge Torres ruled that XRP traded on the secondary market is not a security, um, less than two months later, the New York Department of Financial Services updated their green list and withdrew XRP from the list. It's no longer green listed for residents of New York to trade in XRP on any platform that has a bit license that I, that can operate in New York. So this struck me as kind of odd because Gary Gensler took a took the L, took the loss. You and I went through it line by line, and it was a loss and a big loss and an embarrassing loss. And then the next thing you know, this other state regulator says, no, 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 no. Now that XRP has acquired clarity, they saw security, we're going to delist it. This is what we call a non sequitur. It does not follow at all. In fact, if it had not been on the green list, the decision of Judge Torres would be a reason to add it to the green list, not take it off. And so me being a semi-retired lawyer with a little time on my hands thought, you know what? I'd like to understand what exactly has happened here. Um, this is a uh, government servant, a government agency, and we're supposed to have uh, sunshine laws that allow citizens to understand why their government does what it does. So I sent a Freedom of Information Act to the New York Department of Financial Services immediately after that press release came out. In New York, it's called FOIL with an L instead of FOIA with an A, and it just means Freedom of Information Law. And so, uh, and it's very, very similar to FOIA, and they have a deadline to respond. And all I said was, I would like to have every single document, slip of paper, text, voicemail, video chat, or anything else that involved the decision to delist XRP from the green list. Want all of that. Oh, and the second thing I want is all communications with any other agency of government at any level, including the federal government uh, or any other state or any other agency anywhere in the world where they communicated to you about your decision about whether to delist XRP. And of course, what I was looking for there is whether the SEC had influenced this decision because it makes no sense at all to delist when it's clearly not a security. And a federal judge in the town where you work in Manhattan said, not a security. And so... Anyway, I, so I sent this freedom of information thing and basically. So Mario, I just want to put in one quick comment. Remember this, when we're talking about the XRP lawsuit that took place in New York, and that's why it's so relevant that they removed it from the New York green list, because the irony is even after we won the lawsuit, there was still some political incorrectness when it came to XRP. So let's hear the end of this and we'll discuss it. So far, I don't have any documents. So, so far they have missed two deadlines that they get to extend their own deadline. So now the, the, the next deadline is the end of this month, January 31st. And so while I am a lawyer uh, and I have a license to practice in New York, I've retained a lawyer who's an expert in Freedom of Information Act law cases, and I'm not going to let it go because what was done here is quite bizarre. Perhaps, Brad, there's a rational explanation for this. I cannot think of what it might be, but I'd like to see the documents and see if, in fact, 
you know, somebody put their thumb on the scale and said, look, I know this is embarrassing to take it off the list when it's clearly no longer considered a security, but we got to do it because somebody over here is, is applying pressure. I don't know. I don't know if there was a political consideration, but I intend to find out. And if it requires firing, filing litigation in New York, uh, that's what I will be doing. Mario, and I want to give a shout out to this man. This is James Murphy. So go check this guy out on Twitter. He's always putting out relevant crypto updates. And as you can tell, he was a former lawyer and now he does this full time. So pretty, pretty exciting. What were your takeaways? And I'll share mine. I love that. I, I love uh, listening to him speak. And uh, I, I love the fact that he's actually decided to take it into his own hands and, and kind of like how John Deaton was representing the people he's going after to get answers. And like New York has not made much sense when it comes to crypto and a lot of decisions that they've that they've made over the years. Like I know that I know a lot of people that, that live in New York and they have the toughest time being able to invest in crypto. But this decision to, you know, remove XRP from the list literally once it becomes category or, or, you know, once a New York um, judge rules that XRP is not a security, that that's probably going to top the list of you know, stupid things that happened in New York. <laughs> and uh, yeah, dude, I, I, I loved the, fa- I love the fact that he's going after and he's, he's trying to get answers and it would not surprise me if it has anything to do with, you know, lobbying or like he said, put a thumb on, put a thumb on the, uh, on the scale to kind of tip it that uh, the way that they want it to go or manipulate it the way they want it to go. So yeah, uh, let's see if we're, if they're going to comply with this January 31st uh, deadline, I want to see what comes out from that. Guys, we got four, sorry, 532 live listeners here. Show us some love. Smash that like button. A special thank you to every single one of you being here on a Friday. But this is the news we're breaking down. And what's more important here, Mario, is that there's blatant corruption taking place. The New York crypto regulator removed Ripple and Dogecoin from the tokens green list within the latest update. And I think the term green list is a little bit misleading. Let's go to this crypto basic uh, article here. And I checked this out before the show. So a New York regulator removed XRP from the green list and Ripple payments license was not affected. What happened here? The DFS removed other top crypto assets such as Dogecoin, Litecoin, and XRP from what they were calling the registered green list. The regulator's green list has been trimmed to only support eight assets, including Bitcoin, Ethereum, and PayPal's dollar. In the recent development, part of its efforts made by the DIS to update the virtual currency and oversight regime of the crypto sector. So they're cracking down on crypto through this list. They just stated it themselves. The tokens on the green list were created by the DFS regulator for crypto supervision purposes. Previously, the DFS license uh, holders had the approval to list and custody tokens on that green list using a self-certification system. Once two DFS license holders self-certify a token for listing or custody, the crypto asset would be automatically added to the green list. Although tokens could be added to the green list using the self-certification system, the DFS still supervised the process. In its new guidance, the DFS said that it updated its green token list, trimming the list down to only add eight tokens, removing XRP as well as Dogecoin. So pretty interesting, Mario, just to give people a little background. This comes into utility and custody. That's where this whole green list narrative really affects people. And the fact that it's taking place in the same jurisdiction that the Ripple versus SEC lawsuit was in, I guess it's not a surprise to me, but give me some quick comments and then we'll move forward into this article. Yeah, man, look at that list. So we've got essentially only two cryptos, right? We've only got Bitcoin and Ethereum. The rest, we're talking about stable coins and we've got Pax Gold. So we've got a gold, uh, we've got a gold price backed crypto there. So I think it's interesting. Again, we continue to see Bitcoin and Ethereum. Bitcoin's got that, you know, initial advantage. It, it's it's decentralized. And Ethereum apparently is sufficiently decentralized. So it gets considered to not be a security. And then the rest is all stable coins. I don't get why XRP was removed off the list, especially since the judge has, has already determined it to not be a security in and of itself. Um, so I don't get why that's been removed. I can only think it has to do with some something politically power like uh, that's the only thing that comes to my mind but it, i think it's super interesting the fact that there's only two cryptos on that list and we need like we need we need regulation to finally start moving somewhere because we've been going back and forth with this crypto is a security crypto is not a security ripple has kind of been at the forefront of trying to lead this uh loss with this lawsuit kind of lead it to a to a good place 
but we we need Congress to start passing some laws because I think that at the age that we're at today, at the you know 2024, and we're still kind of in the U.S. fighting on what is a security, what is not a security. There's no regulation. Companies, blockchain companies, don't know how to move forward. Um, other countries in in the, in the world have regulatory clarity have some sort of framework it's not like the u.s has to start from zero and create laws from zero they can look at how these countries are doing it if they think they can do better then you know do better but at least do something um so i yeah we need to get somewhere as far as as far as with these regulations and new york is has been very very strict and only having two cryptos on that list the rest being stable coins I think the tether wasn't on that list, right? No tether stablecoin was on that list. Nope. They have no tether yeah, either. Of course. Yep. Which is interesting. But guys, we're going to shift into a stellar conversation now. We got 544 live listeners here. Show us some love. Smash that like button. Check out this update out of Stellar from this morning, Mario, as they tweeted this out from their Stellar organization Twitter profile. I can't lie. We're feeling super hyped about smart contracts coming to Stellar. Only five more days until the vote is going to bring Sorbin to the Stellar mainnet. So, First question everyone's going to ask, well, what is Sorbin? If I'm even pronouncing that correctly, I'm going to guess it's Soroban, actually. I'll go with Soroban, a developer-friendly, Rust-based smart contracts platform that's designed for scale and sensibility. It's currently live on a testnet, and it seamlessly integrates and works alongside the existing Stellar blockchain. This will allow people the ability to program smart contracts into the XRPL so you can automatically execute transactions without having to uh, increase your costs, Mario. This is a pretty exciting update for everybody in the XLM community because you can't have innovation without smart contracts. And smart contracts are the back end of tokenized assets that really create that value. So just a couple of minutes here. What do you think about the stellar smart contracts and what that really means for the blockchain in and of itself? Yeah, I think that that's super exciting. Um, you know, I mentioned yesterday during the show, yes, uh, on yesterday's show, that I think that it's important to keep an eye on Stellar too because it's kind of this like sleeper. Nobody's really, like most people aren't really paying attention. Uh, you know, obviously we are in this community because we we are constantly talking about XRP, Ripple, and, and Stellar. But most people as investors, they're kind of just keeping an eye on Solana and, and these very hyped a project, Bitcoin, obviously Ethereum, but I think it's it's very important to keep an eye on Stellar. They began like a few months ago when they did their whole rebranding. Um, they began to to like, in my opinion, it looks like they're trying to get very active and they're trying to get to like a, a new place as far as what their mission has been this whole time. And with smart contracts coming to the Stellar ecosystem, like it wouldn't surprise me if we start to, to see some very positive news uh, coming you know, around Stellar's blockchain and, and who they're partnering with and, and what, what, uh, what they're accomplishing with their, with their new smart contracts. So I think that that's, you know, just keep an eye on it. I, I believe Stellar is, is a very uh, prominent player in the blockchain space. And although it's kind of always been considered this, this competitor to Ripple or the sister of Ripple, some people have stated that, you know, Stellar is more for, for the consumer while Ripple is more for the institution. I believe I'm more along the lines that I believe that they're more alike than different and that they're competing more than people actually uh, realize. And I see Stellar just popping out a little bit more over the last few months, again, because of their rebranding and and the utilization of, of that new actor as their kind of their promoter. But uh, yeah, let's keep an eye on Stellar and let's see how those smart contracts actually affect what, what the products that they're coming out with. And price action is the last thing you should be focusing on when you're looking at projects like XLM and XRP because building behind the scenes is way more important. We already have a money management fund tokenized on Stellar in the USA. Franklin Templeton has a money management fund tokenized on the uh, XLM's mainnet network. That's the type of innovation that we're waiting for. And smart contracts like this are going to make it one, two, even three steps easier for people. There's just two quotes I want to read before we move on here, guys. Stellar is building a flexible, reusable function and a ready-to-use contract. So what does that mean? You're going to develop this one time, Mario, and then this will be self-executing going forward. That's going to be huge for the entire network. So just keep that in mind. When we're looking at these partnerships, think long-term utility as opposed to short-term integration. But guys, we got 500. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, let's not forget too, MoneyGram left left Ripple to go work with Stellar and USDC is also working with, uh, is also running on the Stellar ecosystem. So 
it's like there's a lot of good stuff happening in in within stellar so it's very important and like you said the price action should be the least of your focus right now uh it's a great opportunity for you to add to your to your portfolio and get ready for this as well mario because we're going to break down some etfs right now the ethereum etfs are inevitable but when let's hear from hester pierce the sec commissioner today she stated this earlier this week congress did not authorize did not authorize us, meaning the SEC, to tell people whether a particular investment is right for them. But Bitcoin was in a better position for approval because it's the only asset that regulators uniformly classify as a commodity. Breaking with earlier regulators who suggested that Ethereum was sufficiently decentralized, Gary Gensler raised concerns over Ethereum, particularly after the network shifted to a staking mechanism, aka proof of stake. The ongoing lawsuits by the SEC against crypto exchanges offering staking services for proof of stake blockchains, including Ethereum, make a spot Ethereum ETF approval more challenging, at least until these lawsuits are resolved. That's a direct quote from a JP Morgan analyst right there. The SEC hasn't directly mentioned Ethereum in its ongoing lawsuits against crypto exchanges such as Kraken, Coinbase and Binance, but it indicated it might actually classify the cryptocurrency as a commodity. Furthermore, if the SEC opened the fight over Ethereum ETFs, it may have to contend with the Commodity Futures and Exchange Commission, a sibling rival regulator that has also claimed it, uh, jurisdiction over Ethereum. All of this information suggests Ethereum ETFs are inevitable, and yet there are still many obstacles ahead, Mario. So I think we're seeing a battle play out at the SEC, whether it's fake or real, that's up for debate. But I think Ethereum ETFs are going to be addressed in these next couple of months. And um, I did have an article corresponding to it, if I could pull it up correctly. But what it was talking about is how currently with the Ethereum ETF conversation, they're set to address this in March. And they may push it back to May, but I think sometime around June or July, we could have an ETF in the United States that's a spot Ethereum product. What do you take away from this evidence? And then I'm going to play a Hester Pierce video connecting this article. Yeah, I, was, I, th I think there's definitely a battle in in, in the background. Like the, the, the reason... I feel like the reason why Ethereum was given kind of this pass has to do with political power or political incentive, um, because as we've like as as the experts in in you know we've had John Deaton and and some other lawyers kind of explain it much better, but I feel like the way that they kind of skipped over Ethereum and they decided to go after XRP or Ripple. I believe that reveals a lot about what, what what the involvement is with the Ethereum Foundation. And obviously, we all know the stories there. But I really think that there's a battle in the background. Um, there's a battle for, for power. There's a battle for, for control. Ethereum has continued to be this kind of chosen. Uh, it's had a pass. It's sufficiently decentralized. So they, you know, to, to quote what they, what they said. And so we are seeing... I think that it's been positive the fact that we saw a judge rule that XRP was not a security because that is that has allowed for the space to become a little bit more clear and it has allowed for for hopefully some of the corruption that happens behind the scenes with Ethereum to to eventually become become public. So, but like you said, dude, I think that there's definitely a battle and. Um, you know, not to say that Ethereum is going to be under fire all of a sudden and that it's going to, SEC is going to come after Ethereum. Although Gary Gensler has refused to give an answer on what he thinks about Ethereum time and time again, every time he gets asked. So I, I don't know why he's being so hesitant to, to kind of label Ethereum since, you know, we all know, we all know what's happening. We all know that they think Ethereum is sufficiently decentralized. So I don't know why he's been so hesitant to respond there, but um, let's see, man. Like I, I'm I'm hoping I'm hoping that we finally get some regulatory clarity, you know, from from the government, from from Congress. We need we need that to pass so that all of this can we can finally put all of this to rest. Are we still live? I'm not sure if I froze or if abs froze. Can you guys hear me? If you if you guys can hear me in the chat, just let me know. 
I thought it was me that froze. It looks like we lost abs. Abs disappeared. So it was abs. <laughs> I thought it was me for a second. I'm back, guys. They're trying to shut off the stream right now, but I had to battle and get us back on stage. Don't worry. I'm going to play this Hester Pierce video in one second, so just bear with me here, guys, while I share my screen. And Mario, I'm not sure about the last thing you broke down, but what Hester Pierce says within this video is that she believes the SEC may have no right to regulate crypto, and that could fall under the CFTC's jurisdiction. Now we're in a bit of a, an awkward position because Congress has expressed a clear interest in, in stepping into this space and has suggested that maybe the SEC will not be the primary regulator for much of this stuff. And so it's a little bit harder to do now. Um, but I think whatever we do or Congress does, the point should be, let's bear in mind what the objective is, which is to make sure there's enough information out there for people to make decisions. about. What so she said the part, that, the part that I wanted to play there, Mario, which is they may have no right to regulate these assets. So they're nervous to make public statements. That's what she said in and of herself right there. It really speaks to what Gary Gensler is going through as well. Everything they say can and will be used against them, just like in a court of law, my friend. So anything that Hester Pierce comes out and says to the American open markets, I think there's only, from her perspective, it's only negative, right? She's like, all of these things can be used against me. That's why they're hesitant to make bold statements around crypto. But give me some really quick thoughts. I got some other great articles to get into before the end of the show. Yeah, she's been like this positive voice inside of inside of the SEC, which, which is very interesting because she's kind of like all the way at the other end of the spectrum. So... That always has me like thinking, is she really, is, is she just part of the theater, right? Is she like just playing the, the, the good person while, while Gary Gensler and some of these other people are playing the bad, bad person against crypto? So I, I believe that there's a, uh, um, there's an extent of truth to what you said, to what she said. Obviously what they say can and will be used against them. And that is most like that could be very well a reason as to why Gary Gensler has been hesitant to respond to some of these questions that are so straightforward, so simple. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll see, man. Like I, I still remember the time where we were so optimistic when we find found out that Gary Gensler was going to be the head of the SEC because he was a person who understood and taught crypto and blockchain. So we were hoping he was going to be a positive voice inside of that agency, and he's been nothing but the opposite. So. Um, I can't wait for a day we no longer have Gary Gensler, but at the same time, I wonder if anything's going to be different because we all thought Gary Gensler was going to be a type of regulator and he ended up being, he ended up coming into the SEC and kind of just following what the SEC was already doing. So at the same time, it's like, yes, we can get somebody else, but are they going, are they going to be able to speak their mind or, or, or kind of do what, what they want to do? Or are they just going to have to follow the, the, uh, the agency's agenda? It's a great point, Mario. And we've got another exciting update coming to XRP. And this is something we broke down yesterday, but I want to remind people, this is still set in stone. As XRP clawbacks have reached their 80% voting threshold on the XRPL, as long as this holds for another 13 days, we will see the AMMs approved on the XRPL. What does that mean for all of our listeners? It means you're going to have the ability to earn income by staking your XRP into the XRPL and having bigger players tap into these liquidity pools. So, you can earn a small amount on your XRP through these federated side chains and these hooks. It's a pretty exciting development, Mario. And I'm just going to connect it to one other article as well, because I was going through some of the best gaming tokens this morning on the XRPL. And these are a couple of projects maybe some of our listeners are interested in if you want to go and do some research. I don't own any of these. I'm not saying you should. I'm just saying these are some of the best projects when I look at the gaming sector on the XRPL. We've got Fury, which is kind of like a battle royale type thing. It's a gaming, it's a gaming environment where you go in there. It's basically like a first person. Uh, shooter player experience. You also got Casino Coin, X Oge, which is pretty funny, and then Schmeckles. I haven't done any research on that one. These are a couple tokens that could be interesting, right? They're lower caps. They're built on the XRPL. Some great products. And I think over the next 24 months, we're going to see much more real products come to the XRPL, tokenized assets, gaming, whatever you'd like to call it. These types of things are going to become more important. So just wanted to give a couple updates on the XRPL, Mario. Any brief thoughts before we close this thing out? Yeah, I think that's really cool. I love to see like stuff expanding in the XRPL. Like, and, and as we start to get like all these developments that, that we've been addressing here as far as the XRPL, I, I want to see the ecosystem kind of grow and I want to see where it takes. But at the same time, uh, I, I wouldn't want the XRPL to kind of broaden too much. I would love for it to stay somewhat niche driven or within that sector. I, I, I think it might have, it might be a mistake. It might be bad if the XRPL 
tries to expand and, and kind of reach too much, it might lose it might lose a little bit of its core. But on a different note, you know what I did this year? I and I I found this on somebody on X mentioned it, and I would love to give him credit. I don't remember who it was, but somebody was investing in dragon meme coins because we're in the year of the dragon. And so this was just obviously speculation that some of these coins may go up in price because we're in the year of the dragon. So, you know, all to say that this is not anything concise, but just pure speculation. I ended up buying uh, one, it's Tsuka, it's T-S-U-K-A, and the other one is Tyrant, T-Y-R-A-N-T. And obviously full speculation is just because we're in the year of the dragon and I thought, why not? So I, you know, threw in a couple, like $50 or so into some of those. But yeah, that's something I did recently. I just wanted to share it with everyone. That's pretty cool, Mario. And we are going to talk more about later, uh, later on in these weeks, guys, me and Johnny were talking last night about some of the developments we're going to be bringing to the show. And one of the things we're going to be doing is diving into individual private sectors. So for example, we're going to do a show where, for 15 minute segment, we break down all the most exciting projects about AI. We'll do one for NFTs. We'll do one for gaming. We'll do one for banking coins. And like, that's another section of this show we're going to expand on. So some pretty exciting updates are in the works. And if you're enjoying this content, guys, Please show us some love, smash that like button, let the algorithm pump this out to as many listeners as possible because that's the whole goal of this show, right? And let me give a quick update on Hedera because Hedera is another exciting project we often talk about. They they announced this week, we're excited to announce that Get Kiwi Pick, the Hedera-based delivery as a service system, has launched on the Hedera name net as a financial inclusion throughout all of Africa. So we always talk about Hedera, Mario, and it's another exciting update out of Africa. How do you feel about their wallets expanding overseas? Pretty good news. That is pretty good news. Like we, we, I like I really like to see uh, these type of news where in those, in those, like in certain parts of the world where financial, you know, financial in- inclusion is is lacking. I think it's it's good that these people get a way of being able to participate, you know, in the financial world because. In the financial world because bank accounts uh, is something that that they don't really have so I think it's positive um I think that like I believe that this could be an accelerator to to the adoption of crypto the the more that they can get it in the hands of people the simpler they can they can make it um, the better it's going to be for the adoption I still think that there's going to have to be participation from the big financial institutions just because they're kind of the ones that have this massive user base. And I don't see people moving away from their traditional financial system uh, if they have it and if they're used to it. I don't see them moving away from it to go full decentralized crypto, setting up your own wallet, having your your own keys and all that stuff. So, But I think it's a, a, a move in the right direction. And at some point, I would love to see these big financial institutions adopt some of these technologies and make it so that there's more ways for us to be able to transact because it's still extremely painful to to transact value, uh, especially cross border. Like if I want to send money over to another country and I do it through the traditional system, it's still very expensive, sluggish, annoying. And so I want to see this kind of be a push in that direction. And we know that it is. Uh, but I think that these big financial institutions are going to have to play a role in it and somehow adopt it, right? And and put it in the hands of their users. And the next thing we're going to talk about, guys, is XR. Or sorry, not XRP. Somebody commented in the live chat, "Abs, are you moving away from XRP?" Absolutely not, my guy. Never, ever, ever. But how dare you? I will, be, I will be talking about like expanding the show to provide as much value as possible. That's kind of what I was more focused on. How can I get as much good information out as possible? That's why we're going to make these changes to the show. And I promise you, you guys are going to love them because I want your feedback. We got 523 people here. Listen to this update out of CNBC. They're discussing where BlackRock is in their current Ethereum ETF application. And what's the reason for the SEC delaying the approval? Here we go. About the top stories, the SEC is pushing back its decision on BlackRock's proposed spot Ethereum ETF. The reason for the delay? Well, in this filing from yesterday, the agency said it needs more time to review the proposed rule change. Now, this marks the first of several delays the SEC can employ before the regulator must announce a final decision for this ETF. That has to happen within a 240-day period from when the SEC opens comments on the applications. Late last year, BlackRock filed an application with the SEC to convert its Ethereum trust into an ETF. Now, a final decision on all pending spot Ether ETFs, including BlackRock's, 
could come in May as that's the earliest final deadline out of all the applicants. That would be similar to the SEC's decision on all the spot Bitcoin ETF applications, which were approved all at once on January 10th. Now, BlackRock, Invesco, ARK, and Vanek are among the firms in line for approval for a spot Ether ETF, as well as Grayscale, which is seeking to convert its existing Ethereum trust into an ETF. Mario, and what's like so exciting about that is look at what happened with Bitcoin and a spot product potentially being launched. It doubled in price in a matter of months. Ethereum is a fraction of the market cap. If we saw even a similar amount of demand, we're going to see Ethereum's price go to $5,000, $7,000 maybe just based off this ETF news alone. Last thing I want to point out is that they said what we talked about earlier in the episode, they will be addressing this in May of 2024. That is very close. That is a matter of months, guys, that we could have an Ethereum spot product in the USA. And it's these types of moments that define the saying, if you're not early, you're late. Who's going to chase the news and who's been here building their bags? That's what's going to determine people's long-term success in the crypto market. But Mario, you give me your thoughts and we'll continue. Yeah, I think that the thing to keep an eye on, Abs, is um, kind of what what is the SEC stance on Ethereum? Um, I, I obviously think that it's going to get accepted because we've got BlackRock once again as one of the applicants and we know their track record and they did it with Bitcoin. Uh, they were kind of that institution that pushed the, the Bitcoin ETF to finally get approved for everybody that, that had applications. So as far as Ethereum, Gary Gensler has failed to answer a lot of what he thinks or or how he thinks about Ethereum. But I still think that we will see an approval for it. Um, it would be nice to have it. And and was the you said it was the May timeframe or April timeframe. I, I feel like that that's a perfect, perfect timing. We've got so much stuff happening in April as, as it stands. I mean, April, we've got the having, we've got the Ripple versus SEC that's supposed to come to a conclusion around there, around that time. And if we get this narrative of an ETF for, for Ethereum, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a run up on Ethereum. We've seen it with Bitcoin over the last few months uh, of of the you know the second half of last year, and we could potentially see the same thing for Ethereum. Just be prepared that it might be a, a, a buy the rumor, sell the news. We saw it with Bitcoin. We didn't get Bitcoin going you know on an explosion on the day that um, that it launched. Yes, Bitcoin did go up to about forty nine thousand, but then it corrected aggressively and it's been down since. So I would expect the same thing for Ethereum. I would expect Ethereum to run up to the news. And then once the news comes out, that's when you kind of want to sell that news and wait for the price to correct. But nonetheless, yeah, I think that would be positive for, for the altcoin space. And I don't see why XRP wouldn't be next. I mean, if they accept an, an, an ETF for Ethereum, why wouldn't XRP be next? Mario, to close out the show, I'd love to just remind people of what we were talking about earlier because the DFS removed XRP from its green list. And if you're just joining the episode, when I post this thing on YouTube, I will time segment. So just go back, click on the XRP removed from green list segment. We go through an entire article. Mario, maybe you can just give us some thoughts. We went through the list and we showed people it is just Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a list of stable coins that doesn't include Tether. So that's a very important note right there. It also doesn't include USDC. And I'm just I'm just realizing that right now as well. So pretty interesting. Gemini dollar. We've got a PAX dollar, which is gold. There's a lot of good stuff in here. But I would say this. It's much more of a, a headline than it is an actual problem, if that makes sense. Because this isn't like a basket of assets and they removed XRP for no reason. There's no other digital assets in here. And I want to play that video from Metal Lawman again, but because we're short on time, I'm not going to. He said that the lawsuit was a reason to put it on the green list. They used it as an excuse to invert the truth and take it off the green list, Mario. So there's a lot going on, but maybe you can remind people, what do you think? What was your reaction to the news? XRP removed from the green list by the New York, uh, let me get the name correct here, the New York Department of Financial Services. Yeah, I think you're right, Abs. Like, uh, it might not. It, I don't think it's necessarily like a, a really bad thing, uh, because New York, New York has has got this record of just being tough when it comes to crypto and allowing its its residents to even get involved with crypto. So the fact that they even have this list, like, what does it really mean? It means you they're okay with you getting exposure into Bitcoin and Ethereum, and then you've got some stable coins. Um, I mean. I think it's good that the the stable coin. Uh, I think it's good that they've got the stable coins in there because it's an alternative use for 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 the dollar in this in this specific scenario. But as far as it being a bad thing, I, I don't think it is a bad thing. I think you're right, and so it's just 
something to keep an eye on. I I think the more the the most frustrating part of of, of all of this news is just why did they get rid of Ripple or XRP? Sorry, why did they remove XRP when XRP actually has now been deemed not a security by by a judge in New York? So that's kind of more more of the um, I guess you could say frustrating part of that story. But as far as them having that list, I mean, it's just New York for you. And guys, we're going to play a very exciting video right now about Anthony Scaramucci because we addressed this last week. Do you guys remember the name Robbie Michnik? He is the lead for digital assets at BlackRock. And what's important to know about that, Robbie Michnik was on the board of directors at Ripple or the board of advisors at Ripple. Now he's a BlackRock employee. And this is Anthony Scaramucci and Scott Melker discussing. I love the quote that this person put in the tweet. They said, have bad news for the XRP haters and the Bitcoin maximalists. Robbie Michnik didn't just go to BlackRock to stop at orange pilling Larry Fink. Get ready for an XRP product as well. And Mario, I do know you have to run. So I just want to say thank you so much for joining the show. I'm going to play this brief video, guys, and we're going to discuss it behind the scenes. Here we go. Now, there's a guy named Robbie Michnik at BlackRock. He's a young kid. He came into BlackRock with the idea of creating a Bitcoin ETF. He orange pilled Larry. And I'm going to give Larry a lot of credit because Larry actually did the homework. Larry did the reversal. Larry was on the road to Damascus and converted as a result of being steeped in understanding exactly what it was and why it will be an international store of value. And, and, and I got to tell you something. It takes a very smart leader to pridefully say that Bitcoin sucks and then 24 months later say, you know what, I've got this wrong. BlackRock needs to be a part of this and BlackRock needs awesome. to have a significant stake in it. So, so no, I don't think he's just talking his book. He's not that type of person. And he has said two things that you should pay attention to if you're an investor here. Number one, it's a store of value. And number two, it represents a flight to quality, Scott. I want you to think about that, okay? This asset has experienced 100 vols, okay? It's gone from 80 to 100 vols. We've seen the asset go from 69 to 16. We've seen it do all different types of haywire things. But the largest asset manager in the world, the CEO of that company says it is a flight to quality, okay? So that implies that he understands it. Last point of the story, it's now 23. It's January. Robbie comes to see us. My partner, Brett Messing, who I don't think you've met, he says to my partner, look, I'm getting a lot of bureaucratic resistance at BlackRock. I need some outside money in this Bitcoin trust. So we sent them 10 million bucks. We said, OK, we're in. So we were the first money in. He then went to the ETF committee and said, we can raise outside money for this. And they said, OK, you can raise outside money for this. Let's give it a go. And they were watching that grayscale case carefully. Their lawyers told. So I'm going to pause it there because I think that he goes into the grayscale case and everybody pretty much understands that on our show. But what did he describe about Larry Fink's realization when it came to Bitcoin? was that it came from the relationship he has with Robbie Michnik, who is currently the head of digital assets at BlackRock. And I think this is going to be pretty valuable. So I'm just going to Google Robbie Michnik's name and show you what comes up. This is what's so interesting about the world of finance. Everybody is connected. It's, it's, it really is unbelievable. We're going to check out his link tree. If this is the correct link, I hope it is. Let me just check this out. Uh, yes. So this is right here. He's an MBA candidate at the Stanford School of Graduate and Business prior to a career with Ripple and a CCP investment on the board. This is the man who's leading digital assets. And you heard it from Scaramucci. You don't have to take my advice. This is who's in Larry Fink's ear when he's talking about innovation into the digital asset space. So thank you so much, guys. We're going to close this thing out by saying thank you. I want to say thank you to Mario and thank you to every single one of our live listeners out there. We got 505 live listeners joining us. Show us some love. Smash that like button. Have an amazing weekend. I also want to give a shout out. Zach Rector will be coming on the show next week. Very exciting guest for GMC. We love you guys. We'll see you in 72 hours. And like we always say, Warriors, rise. Get your shit together, baby. Thanks for joining us.